This is the one time we do not want you to shut up and cook. We want to, we want you to speak up and okay. talk about this incredible cookbook, which I have been having so much fun with. I brought out my copy of the book because I've, I wanted to show everybody I've been dog-earing it and underlining stuff and like making notes on the recipes, which is exactly how you designed this. Can I say what you be. brought in? Yeah. She brought in muffins. She made the muffins and brought them in. Like, who does that? <laughs> well, I wanted to be able to talk to you from a point of view of experience with the with I'm the project. And, and these muffins, so I made the spelts muffins with blueberries. Right. And you know, who doesn't love a good blueberry muffin? But I have found that, you know, if you go to, to a coffee shop and get a muffin, it's more like a cake. And it's people try to think that they're, tell themselves that they're eating a healthy breakfast right. when they grab a muffin, but really they've just had a piece of cake for breakfast. Right. But these are made mostly with bananas. Yes. A little bit of spelt flour, which I learned is an... Why don't you tell people, like, what, what the heck is spelt? I, I'm shocked that you even know the ingredients off at the top of your head. Well, I made the recipe twice in three days because I ate those muffins so fast. <laughs> spelt is a, it's easier flour to digest. So if you, it still has gluten in it, but it's the process. So I urge you to try it. Um, you can make many different things with it. And it's something that I found, it's easier for me as the type of flour to digest. And my kids do well with it. Try it. Like, they have spelt bread, you muffins, you can make it, create it, make it your own. You can get it pretty much at any supermarket. And what I am especially grateful for, I'm a changed woman because of spelt, <laughs> is that it's one-to-one -one ratio to white flour. So right. you can basically use it in any recipe that calls for Were you for using flour. spelt before? No. This is your first time? Yes, it's my first experience with spelt. And you're you, hooked? You have changed my life. Wow. Yeah, I'm really excited. Already. I can't wait to try other recipes that I've been making with, I mean, I don't, and I don't cook a lot. Um, but when I do, I've used really traditional ingredients, and I've learned so much just from the few recipes I've tried. Well, you can try pancakes, mm -hmm. waffles, anything that requires flour, you can try spelt flour. Yeah. Like, don't limit yourself. There's so much out there. Bean flour, there's so much. I want to start with the topic of, I mean, the, the title of the book, Shut Up and Cook. This came from some resistance that you were finding, excuses not to get to work in the kitchen. I hated my kitchen. I did not know how to use it. I had two kids in this city, so busy. I ordered all the time, but I made the broccoli. So I ordered the chicken fingers, I ordered the french fries, I ordered the pasta, but I steamed the broccoli. So... That's how I use my kitchen. But I was making my kids sick. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? I have every excuse why I don't go in there and why I'm not preparing meals. And I'm looking at these two kids and myself who I'm making sicker and suppressing their immune system. And they're growing, and we want to do the opposite. And I said, get out of your way. You need to shut up and cook. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it came about. It's really get out of your way, stop with the excuses, and just get into your kitchen and, and, and learn how to use it beyond pouring a glass of water, which is what it was for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your kids have food sensitivities, and so do you, right? Yes. How did you identify those? Did they have the traditional allergy tests at the doctor? They did. We did skin, and then I had to educate myself and get more aware of skin versus blood. And so we did blood testing, which gives you more of an accurate reading in your IgE levels. And so they've outgrown so much, and I really contribute that to their diets. I really contribute to how they were being fed, how I was feeding them, the things that I took out. I allowed their digestive system to get healthy and get cleaner and build up that flora inside. And now they're just allergic to nuts. But, I mean, I started this 16 years ago, mm -hmm. so there was no gluten-free. There was no soy-free. What you see today... I had to go in the store and cry because nothing was available. And I had to figure out how do you feed these kids who are sensitive, who are allergic, and there's nothing available to them. So I had to get in the kitchen and just play, and that's how all this came about. You were lucky because you had some people in your past who were ahead of the curve. You, yeah. you tell so many stories in this book. In addition to the recipes, there are these sections that sort of tell your moments of inspiration or where, uh, where you had the seed of the idea for these. And so many of them come from your grandmothers. Um, and you have ones that come from, like, you went to Marcus Samuelson's restaurant and you loved one of yes. his res recipes so much you went home and you were like... I oh, wonder if yes. I can invent that from scratch. I did. I was pregnant, and I craved. It's. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been pregnant and craved the soil. You know, you hear pregnant women want earth. I didn't think that was true until I got pregnant, and I craved a little bit of dirt. He made the salad. It was not a dirty salad. He <laughs> made the salad, but this, the, the lettuce that he used with the watermelon 
it was just so delicious, and that's all I wanted when I was pregnant. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to figure out how to make my own version. And so I do that with a lot of recipes. I'll go out to eat, and I'll go in restaurants, and I'll figure out how can I make my version that will accommodate myself or my friends or my loved ones and so on and so on. I also love how you will take a recipe like the pizzas, and you will say, here's the version I make for my a dairy sensitive child and mm -hmm. here's the version that I make for my non dairy sensitive child and it really comes down to basically sprinkling real mozzarella on half of it and like meltable dairy freeze <laughs> cheese substitute <laughs> on the other half and it really goes to show that you can accommodate Absolutely. multiple palates, multiple Absolutely. digestive systems all at once. We get in our own way. And that's why I say shut up and cook. Um, with, with my kids, you know, when they were younger, they're 16 and 14 now, they would say, oh, I want the real cheese. And I'm like, well, this is the real cheese. That other cheese is not the real cheese. Mm. <laughs> that's processed. That's something different. But now they don't care. I mean, we just want to eat good. People want healthy, good tasting food. We don't care what it is. If you make a big deal about it, then it becomes a big deal. But when I cook and I make a smoothie with rice milk, they're not fighting me and saying, it's rice milk, mom. Mm -hmm. They're like, it's a smoothie. You know, we, we get in our own way. How do you um, handle them going to like friends to sleep over or par parties at school or something like that? Like how okay. do they handle their food? So they're older there? now. Yeah. Th there is uh, a mom here who was in my educational years when my children were younger, and it was a fight to bring their lunches to school, mm -hmm. their desserts. I mean, we went through it. Now they're older, and I know what I'm cooking at home. I know what I'm providing for them at home. They're humans. They're kids. We're not going to sit here and eat this way 100% of the time. You know, you find the balance. And so when they go out with their friends, whether it's on the weekend, it's to whatever, whatever it is, they make their own choices, mm -hmm. you know? I just know what I'm giving them at home, and I make that balance, you know, and I don't make a big deal about it. Moderation is such a difficult thing for so many people, and there are, there like that in that pizza recipe we were talking about, um, you actually use store-bought frozen pizza dough. Right. And I was at first surprised, because I thought, you know, the, this is all about healthy recipes and, you know, sort of a, a farm-to-table approach and stuff, and I was like, really, you can buy something pre-packaged? But I loved how you you said it's about doing it well when you can yes. and also being realistic. Absolutely. You have to be realistic. I mean, I'm not a perfectionist. I can't, I have two kids. We're busy. You know, we live in 2017. Everything is constantly moving so fast. You know, the reality of it is I want to feed them well. I like to make a pizza for them versus ordering a pizza. I know the ingredients that are going into it. There's nothing wrong with buying a store-bought pizza. We're not eating it every single night. But the key that I found that works for us is I buy a jar of pizza sauce, but I put fresh herbs and fresh garlic, fresh ingredients in it. So when you're boiling it, you're getting the nutrients added into that jar because you don't know how long is that pasta sauce really being in that jar. Like, how long? You know the expiration has not come, but how long has it been in that jar? And you don't know. So I add nutrients to it. And they love their pizza. Yeah. Um, what are the favorite recipes from this book that you make for each member of your family? Oh, come on. <laughs> well, there's okay. one. There's one. There's a chicken dish yeah, that your husband say, loves. My husband loves this chicken dish. So it was on a Sunday morning. I wish I, wish I had showed you the picture because, oh, the kitchen was a mess <laughs> beyond, like, I mean, I have a picture of me looking over the dishes like, really? Like, no one's going to help? But I was in the kitchen. I had all these fresh herbs, and I did not know what to do with the herbs. And so I had this vision. I'm going to just throw it on top of the chicken. And it looked like chicken in a garden. And that's how it came about the name, chicken in a garden. It's so pretty. It's really poultry, and it's covered with this greenery with different textures because there's different herbs in it. And I slow cooked it. And I remember talking to my grandmother on the phone, and she was like, your chicken is still cooking? And I said, yes, Nana, like, I'm, I'm slow cooking it. You're doing what? And I'm like, I'm slow cooking it. I cooked it for hours, but it, it tore off the bone and my husband fell in love with it and he'll say are you making that chicken are you making that chicken and I'm like yeah I'm making that chicken <laughs> well it it looks beautiful I can't wait to try it um it's easy this book has that uh 
the features of a beautiful coffee table type book, you know, where the pictures are all, they just Thank jump you. off the page, Thank but you. also, you know, it, 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 the soft cover and the page, the spots on the page to write makes you want to dig in and actually use it. You're supposed to get it messy. Mm -hmm. It's a cookbook. It is not a coffee table book. It is a cookbook. Write your notes in there. I have given you the foundation. So what you can do is tweak it and make it work for you. So if you add it, blah, blah, blah in it versus blah, 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 then write what you add it. So when you cook it the next time, you know what it is that you did. So make it yours. Don't be afraid to get this book dirty, spill oil on it, whatever. Have fun with it. I think we should clarify that despite having put this incredible thing together and invented oh, so many you. recipes, you don't thank call you. yourself a chef. Why is that? Far from it. <laughs> no, I don't like cooking, first of all. What? I, I do not like cooking. What I like and what I love is feeding everyone well and the benefits. I don't. That's why I ran. I did not want to be in the kitchen, and I thought you had to be a Betty Crocker in order to make something. you got to be in there all day, and I don't have time. And so it's like I'm never going to cook because I, I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't think you could come up with simple, easy recipes and literally be in and be out. And so um, I just went for it. So you're not a chef. How do you identify yourself? I'm a home cook. Uh -huh. I cook every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the weekends. My kids go to school, so breakfast is rushed. It's a little different. Um, but I'm a home cook, and I like to encourage all of us to take it back home. When we were growing up and we ate at home, we were what? Less sick. There was no such thing as two-year-olds being obese mm. like there is today. Nowadays, we're going for convenience, and convenience is having an impact on not just my health as an adult, but the children, you know, below and so on and so forth. And so we have to take it back home. Go into your kitchen and figure out how you can make meals that work for you. You don't have to be in there all day. I thought I, thought I had to be in there all day, even to bake, even a, a pizza. The reason why I'm not in there all day when I'm making a pizza is because I got help from the store who sells the frozen pizza uh -huh. dough, you know, but... You don't have to be in the kitchen all day. You just feed yourself, and that's how you feel well. And anything internally reflects externally. You know, we, we think man can alter our look and make us look a certain way, and they can. But at the end of the day, no man can do what, what Mother Earth does. Mm -hmm. And the food is what nourishes your blood cells and really gets you to a place where you can thrive in the world and, and feel mentally and physically healthy. What is your all-time favorite food? Food? Yeah. Mm. What day? Let's see. <laughs> right now. <laughs> I love pizza. Yeah? Oh, I love pizza. <laughs> it's my weakness. I love pizza. What are your toppings? It depends. If I'm craving artichoke and, and um, avocado, I'm going for that. I'm putting that on it at home. Avocado on pizza, huh? Oh, yes. Slice it when it's all cooked. You don't cook the oh, uh -huh. avocado. You can if you're smothering. You can mash it. That's a whole other recipe. You can mash <laughs> your avocado and make that your base instead of tomato sauce. Ooh. But what I'm speaking of is if I want just slice avocado and slice artichoke and a non-dairy cheese, mm, squeeze a little lemon on it and some crushed red pepper, that is my thing. Okay, I want that. I'm going to stop. <laughs> cut the interview short and we're going to go get some pizza. So I love, I love pizza. I want to know what tools it's important to have in the kitchen, especially if, hypothetically, one were to live in a small New York City apartment. Absolutely. Um, what are the tools? You, know, you might not have room for a, a food processor nope. and a blender and a you don't Whatever. need all that. What do you need? And you do not need a KitchenAid. I'm here to tell you. I'm not a baker, but you do not need a KitchenAid. I d none of these recipes are uh, KitchenAid, that big, heavy equipment that weighs more than we do. No. <laughs> Cast iron skillet. You can make almost anything and everything in it. And you're getting the nutrient, the iron, from the cast iron. I think everyone should have a cast iron skillet. It does not have chemicals. I don't know if you know this, but certain, um, not flatware, what do you call the stuff we cook on? Uh, not dishware. Pots and pans. Pots and pans. Yeah, there you go. Pots and pans. Certain pots and pans release chemicals when they're heated. You can't see it, but it's going into your food. A cast iron, you don't have that because of, of how it's made, the ingredients that it's made into, and what it releases when it's heated is iron. So you're getting the extra nutrient. And so I remember when I was told I was anemic, I made everything in a cast iron skillet like 
I, when I say everything, everything. And then I went back for a test, and they're like, your iron level's low. What did you take? I'm like, cast iron skillet. They're like, what? I'm like, just cast iron skillet. So I kind of believe that. So cast iron skillet. I personally like to use wooden sp- spoons, and I like personally a wooden cutting board, um, just because the wooden cutting board, when it's wet, the, the bamboo, for instance, on a, a bamboo cutting board, when it's wet, the, the wood, it helps so the bacteria doesn't seep in. And um, I, I like those things. So I think a cast iron for sure. Everyone should. That's the one thing you should invest in because you're getting benefits from using it as well. And there's no aluminum. A lot of pots and pans have aluminum, and that's a heavy toxic metal. And we don't connect that to certain things when we're cooking. But anything you're heating up is going into your food, and you just don't see it. What about electronics, like a blender? There's some great blended recipes in here. I use it. Yeah. Oh, like... Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, about other, like, tools like that that we should have on hand. A blender of your choice. You know, whatever (laughs) brand you want to get because you can make a smoothie. You know, if you... We're so obsessed in this country with weight. Weight would not be an issue if we knew how to eat. And if we knew how to eat, we would not be so sick Kids would not be so medicated. Adults would not be so medicated. Um, That's why I really encourage us and urge us to take it back home and get in the kitchen and cook. Um, But a blender is great. So if you want to start juicing, you know, you don't have to go buy this over-the-top expensive juicer. A blender works just as well. And for some, it works even better because juicers, uh, excuse me, blenders, you're getting all the fiber. It's not releasing and extracting. Like some juicers, they'll have an end where the liquid comes out. And then the other end, it's like the waste. Well, this is the fiber. And you want the fiber. You know, we're so obsessed with protein, protein, but we really need fiber, 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 you know? Um, so a blender is important. Cast iron skillet, wooden spoons, cutting board, because if you're using fish, if you're using meat, you don't want to leave that on your counters because of bacteria, E. coli, certain things can come, you know, into your space. Um, if you're, you're cracking eggs, you know, a cutting board is a good investment to have in your home and make sure you clean it and clean it well. I'm going to add from personal experience, mason jars, because <laughs> another one of the recipes I tried from this book is these pickled vegetables, which take about five minutes. It's basically like apple cider vinegar, warm water, uh, maple syrup, oh. Is there one other ingredient? Salt. And salt. Mm-hmm. And then you chop up, I did cauliflower, radishes, and carrots. You just like chop them, throw them in there in a mason jar, leave them in the fridge for a few days. And it's like, I've been eating them instead of potato chips. They're so they're crunchy and salty and they're like great hit snack. all of those points. I've, again, life changed. Thank you. Just from the two recipes that I've tried. I you cannot can wait to keep going. On top of a salad. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, Broccoli, what did you do? The cauliflower, the carrots, the radish? Yeah. Put it on top of a salad. It's so, you don't even need a salad dressing. Right. It's so delicious. Like, uh, So many things to try. Uh, oh, I want to go back to the blender because there are a couple stories in the book about mistakes that you've made that have yes. turned into your favorite recipes. Like, who would have known that you could make a soup out of fruit? But somebody over-blended her smoothie and invented a whole new raspberry, recipe. Raspberry soup. I had no idea. (laughs) I thought I was making a smoothie, but I left the blender going so much. And so when I poured it, I was like, ding dong, this is soup. I'm going to call this dessert. This is a raspberry soup. So good, you guys. It's so delicious. It's just fresh raspberries. And I just parade it by accident too long. And and it it lost the smoothie texture. It was, you know, slurpy. Eat it with a spoon. So good, and it's a great dessert, and you're getting all those antioxidants. It's so delicious. You can squeeze a little lime on there, a little lemon. Make it yours. You there know? are so many stories that I feel like I want to <laughs> get like dig into. Um, we don't have that much time left, and we're going to make sure to save some time for questions from the audience. But I will say that even if you're feeling hesitant about cooking and you're not quite ready to make that leap yet, this is worth picking up just for the read. Because it reads kind of like a memoir, too, like a (laughs) food-related memoir. Um, There's one story I want you to tell about how you learned how to add shredded chicken to your chicken soup instead of cutting the chicken into cubes. Okay, so I used to... So one of my kids had a cold. This is years ago. It's been 11 years. 
My kids have not had any medicine. And these are kids that were on antibiotics all the time. These are kids that were at the doctor's office every week, every month. It got to the point where the doctor called one day, our pediatrician, and said, are you seeing another doctor? And I said, no, why? And she said, I used to see your kids in here all the time. Is it really just the diet change? And I said, I've done nothing else. So literally, my kids have had no medicine in 11 years. And so one day they had a cold, and I was like, gosh, I didn't know how to make chicken soup, but I was like, okay, well, there's a liquid, and I know I've seen garlic in it, and I've seen celery and onions, and I just started chopping. I didn't measure. I just tried to figure out. And your kids are honest. They will tell you if it's, or they'll let you know. My kids were like this with that, that chicken soup. So I was cutting the soup in cubes, the chicken, chicken excuse me, the chicken <laughs> breast. I was cutting it just in little square cubes. And so one day we were in um, Los Angeles, and it's an area, it's very sad, very unfortunate. Like, I, I, it's just really heartbreaking that there's even a neighborhood that exists like this. But it's called Skid Row. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but. I've never seen anything like it in my life, but we went down there one Thanksgiving, and um, it's very important for me to get my children to, you know, give back and participate and, and be hands-on and see how other people live, and Thanksgiving, to see these people are coming in for a meal with people they don't even know, like, when we're done, we're going home, we know our guests that are coming, we know our family and our friends, but these people are eating with whomever, you know, is just happy to get that meal for the day. And so prior to us serving the food, we each had a responsibility. And so my responsibility was they put me on the turkey, and they said, you have to just take the turkey and shred it like this. And as I'm doing it, I literally had a chicken light bulb soup moment. It was like, oh, my gosh, this is how I can make my soup. I can shred it. So now it looks pretty. It's not just the cubes because I didn't know how to – I did not know how to shred chicken. Until we went and did our philanthropic work one day for Thanksgiving. The they put me in the soup kitchen on turkey and had me shred it because they were making shredded turkey with gravy. And that was when I said, oh, my gosh, this is what I can do to the chicken breast. And so now I know how to shred it. But prior to, I don't have any formal training. I've never, you know, done cooking classes, nothing. So I didn't know how do you get chicken to have a shredded look. I had no idea. And it wasn't until we went to the soup kitchen. Well, I've heard the saying that the most important ingredient in any recipe is the love of the cook. 100%. And something as simple as taking the time and energy to shred the chicken with your hands. Like, I really feel like that love gets infused into the food. I can't tell whether you're laughing at me. No, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just like, you are so spot on. You're right. It's taking that time to shred chicken because the quickest way was to keep it in cubes. But it was a look that I was going after, and the chicken kind of lasted a little bit longer when it was shredded versus in a cube, because in a cube, it's just, you know, it's gone after a bite. But the shred of the chicken, it kind of gives you a little extra soup. (laughs) The effort that you have put into creating all of these recipes and the inspirations from your own family members, your children, your grandmothers, your, you know, the, the soup kitchen, the Jean Georges is referenced in one of the... Yeah, he's uh, the cover. Oh, yeah, the, the carrot avocado salad. This is from, I don't know if you're familiar with the restaurant out here. It's called ABC Kitchen. So I love the carrot avocado salad that they have there. But they put, like, pumpkin seeds on it and, and dairy and some other stuff. And so I didn't know how to make it, and I didn't ask him to give me his recipe. And I said, I'm going to make my own version. And that's what this is. So this is Erica's version of Jean George ABC Kitchen. It and is, it made the cover. It's <laughs> beautiful. Everything in here is beautiful. Thank and you. And I really think that the most important characteristic of any of these recipes is the love that you've put into creating them and the love that the, the cooks at home will put in just by nature of sharing something with you through this book. Thank you. Let's take some questions from the audience. Sure. How do you come up with the new recipes except the... Um, cases that you told us how do you come up with them how do you invent new things it's like a painter i'm not a painter but when you get an idea i don't know if you're creative when you have an idea to do your hair different or to put makeup on for me that's how it is in the kitchen i don't know what i'm doing i just oh my gosh let me put this together and i'll give you a great example recently 
I saw a green chicken in my head, but I didn't know what was making it green. And so I said, I'm going to take cilantro and parsley and put it in the blender and then smother it on the chicken. And that's what I did. And so it was like a lime cilantro parsley chicken. So when I just get an urge to do something, I'm not afraid. I just go for it. If it doesn't work, I try it again until I get it right. Cooking, you don't have to go to school for it. You don't have to have you know, a degree in it. It's one of those things you have to trust yourself and let inside come out, and you'll be so surprised. I have 101 recipes. If you would have asked me this five years ago, ha, huh, this, this would have been a joke, okay? <laughs> I hated the kitchen, never loved cooking, but I, I like playing and coming up with stuff and feeding people well and knowing that my children were on a better road of health as a result. You have a couple of times when you, in the intro in particular, where you encourage people to make mistakes. Absolutely. And learn from them. Yeah. And I love a good growth mindset. And uh, <laughs> I think having the freedom to experiment is really important. But that's life. Yeah. You know, what is life without mistakes? We don't grow. And you have to grow in the kitchen. And in order to grow in your kitchen, you have to make mistakes, you know? And do I, do I still burn pots? Absolutely, because I get distracted. I run to go help someone, and I forget something was cooking, and then the smell tells me, ooh, you were cooking. <laughs> i got to make it again. Do we have another question? Thanks Hi. for being here. Of course, um, thank you. I know you said that you created a lot of these recipes. Were you able to fit any childhood recipes into your cookbook? Any? Childhood recipes. Yes. So my mother cooked for my sisters and I, single family. My mother raised three girls all by herself. She went to work and different times through her working years, either she worked in the mornings or she worked at night. But whenever she worked, she made dinner for us. So if she had to go in the morning, she'd come home, make dinner. If she had to work the night shift, she made dinner in the morning. So I grew up on something called Palau, which is in the book. It's a Trinidadan um, dish that my mother's best friend Bliss taught her. And we grew up on it. It's pigeon peas, chicken, and rice. And it's incredible. And that's on there. My That's in there. My grandmother, she, my grandmother was she is to this day 95 years old and she says the reason why she's still alive is because she eats the way that she knew how to eat growing up which is her collard greens her tomatoes like everything fresh so she's always like I don't eat this new packaged stuff and she's like I know I'm living to this day because I eat what I knew I grew up on um, but my grandmother always made homemade rolls and my son was allergic to dairy, and so he could never have Nana's rolls. And I said, I'm going to figure out how he can have Nana's rolls. And so I tweaked the recipe. So a lot of it, if you're vegan, if you're raw, if you're paleo, it speaks to you. There's really something in there for every single person, whether it's you, your family, your children, your partners, your loved ones. There's something for everyone. You're serving Thanksgiving. There's guests coming over. There's something for that guest in your in their, in your in the book. Um, but there's things that don't have white flour, eggs, sugar. I don't use any sugar at all, um, and I sweeten with a lot of maple syrup. And that's it. So there's things that I grew up on, and uh, kibasa and uh, sauerkraut is one of them. My mother, you know, when payday didn't come around, and she was I'm not going to be in the kitchen making chili tonight. She would make sauerkraut with kibasa, and that's in the book. So some of the childhood recipes and things that I grew up on, they're absolutely in there, and I figured out a way how I can make it more modern, and more modern is how we are today. More sensitive, we don't want gluten or we can't have it, we can't tolerate the things we used to be able to tolerate. So it has a more of a modern twist on it. Without depriving yourself, there's even candy, truffles in there, donuts, cheesecake, like, but a healthier alternative. The dairy-free cheesecake is like, do not run. <laughs> I did say dairy-free cheesecake. And tofu at that. Yeah. It's tofu it's cheesecake. Like good for you. And yeah, and it's basically health food cheesecake. But nobody knows it's tofu. Like when you hear tofu, it's like, ugh. But when you say taste this cheesecake, people have no idea. And then when you tell them what it is, they're like, what? Tofu? No <laughs> you way. tricked me. That's awesome. We have time for one more. Hi. Hi. I was just curious, are there any ingredients that you haven't tried yet, but you want to test them out? Any ingredients? Yeah. Hmm. Yes. I want to do more with turmeric mm. beyond drinking it. Mm -hmm. I boil yeah. it and make a tea with it. 
um, and I, I use the ground turmeric, maybe like in my turkey meatballs and stuff, mm-hmm. but I want to be more creative with the root of turmeric, oh. and okay. that I haven't done yet. How often do you shop? Twice a week. Yeah? And you manage to... I always feel like whenever I want to do a new recipe, I have to go to the store that day. No, I... I I do, t- okay, well, for food, I do once a week, twice a week, because then I had to buy toilet tissue and blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. I like the farmer's market. So I hit the farmer's market once a week, and I get everything. One thing you have to do that helps yourself, find one day that works for you. For me, it's Monday, because Monday gets me through the week. And so get that one day, wash your vegetables, just, just get that tedious work out of the way because then if it's in your container, your Ziploc bag, however you're storing your fruits, vegetables, whatever it is, it's clean and it's ready. So when you're able and ready to cook, you don't have to think about, oh, but I got to wash this. It's already washed. It's already washed. So I hit the grocery store once a week. There are so many great lessons in Shut Up and Cook. Thank I'm you. thrilled that this is out there. It has I'm excited that I had the chance to try a few of the recipes. I want to go try all of the rest of them. I can't believe you brought muffins. (laughs) I wanted to show you that I was serious about really learning who you you. are and what you do. And I hope everybody in the studio audience who's watching online, I hope everybody will do the same. Thank you. It's really worth it. Uh, Erica, thank you so much for being here and sharing your love of the kitchen with us. Thank you all, really. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.